Hello and welcome to Crazy Hank TV. Today we're going to discuss the TV show Deadwood. As many of you know, that's my probably my favorite show of all time. I love Deadwood. But today we're also going to discuss the characters and the real people of Deadwood and their stories, how they may be different from what you've seen on the TV show. Now, if you don't want the, the experience of Deadwood to be ruined by knowing some of the facts, you might want to just say, okay, I'm out of here. But I've known the facts for years and it's still... I love the show, and I'm doing. I'm actually, my wife and I are doing a rewatch right now. So I thought we'd start with Martha Bullock first. In the TV series, Martha is played by Anna Gunn, who does a fantastic job portraying uh, Martha Bullock. But in real life, Martha and Seth were childhood sweethearts. The two married in Salt Lake City, Utah, in 1874. She went back with him to Montana. However, when Seth moved his business to Deadwood with Saul Starr, Martha and their infant child. Madge went to stay with their parents in Minnesota. So I guess that's kind of true that she was in Minnesota with her family when he went to Deadwood. Um, but he, there was no, he was, she was never married to her brother, his brother, and there was no William. So William may have been a cousin. We don't know. After Seth got the business going in Deadwood and helped tame the lawless mini, uh, mining camp. Martha and her daughter came to Deadwood. The couple had two more children. Martha became a pillar of the Deadwood community. So, story's different than what we see on the TV show, but again, it doesn't ruin it for me. It, it's close enough, and the the drama and everything they also had in it, it's, it's still good TV. So, I, I'm not going to fault them for that, but that's the true story on that. Next, we're going to move to... Johnny Burns. Now, Johnny, again, it's a little bit different than we're used to seeing on, on the, the TV show. On the TV show, he's kind of a lovable guy. He's he's uh, he, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but he's he's a, he's a caring person, and he, he's he's not uh, he, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. But while little is known about the real character, he did work for Al Swearengen at the Gem Theater. His job at the Gem was as a box herder, a term used to describe the person char in charge of the girls and to keep them in line. Unfortunately, Burns was said to have been brutal on the ladies, beating them often. So. He's not the lovable, likable guy we see on the TV show. But I guess they can't have everyone be a bad guy on the show. So that's the story of Johnny Burns. Next up, we have Calamity Jane, probably one of the more fascinating characters from the TV show. But Calamity, was she was renowned for her excellent marksmanship, preference for wearing men's clothing. She had a rowdy behavior. as well, And that's pretty true to, the sh uh, to how the show portrayed her. Jane was uh, said to have been an army scout, a bullwhacker, a nurse, a cook, a prostitute, a prospector, a gambler, and a heavy drinker. Well, we knew that. She's one of the most foul-mouthed people in the West. In June of 1876, she partnered with Wild Bill Hickok as an outrider for the Colorado Charlie Utter wagon train, galloping into Deadwood with a shipment of prostitutes fresh from Cheyenne. For the remainder of her days, Calamity Jane claimed to be, have been Hickok's lover, but records show that Hickok, uh, while Bill was recently married, and his letters from home from Deadwood indicated that he was happily wedded. Calamity Jane requested to be buried next to Wild Bill when he died. And so there's the story of Jane. It's pretty close, except it went in the TV show they don't arrive with a, sh a shipment of prostitutes. But, you know, we don't actually get to see what's inside the wagon in the TV show, so maybe the prostitutes were in there we just didn't see them. Next up is Dan Dordery. Now, Dan did work for Al Swearingen. Uh, he acted as general manager of the Gem Theater when it first opened in 1877 and was also rough with the women. Two years later, Dan partnered up with a man called Johnny Cooley and opened up their own saloon. Somewhere along the line, Dordery married while in Deadwood. He stayed in the camp until the late 1880s when he moved to Nevada. So, Dan is pretty spot on, I guess. Uh, I don't recall there being an episode where he's beating on one of the prostitutes, but that was him in real life so moving on we're going to go to E.B. Farnham now E.B. on the show they portray as kind of a, a weasel he's a single guy he's he's not he's it doesn't at times he's not very smart but other times he is kind of clever when it's it, deceivious ways but before coming to Deadwood E.B. Farnham and his wife with three children lived in Wisconsin one of the first non-mining residents in Deadwood Farnham opened up a retail store in 1876 Seeing the growth potential of the camp, he also secured claims for several other Main Street lots. Soon joining up with area businessmen, uh, the group financed and built Deadwood to Central Toll Road to ensure that the camp could get uh, needed supplies. Uh, the successful Farnham went on to invest in several Deadwood mining 
ventures. On August 18, 1876, he was elected mayor of Deadwood, working first to obtain the official recognition of the settlement by the Dakota Territory government. Soon salaries and costs for maintenance were paid with new fees levied on Deadwood businesses, and that was in the TV show. Farnham was also active at head of the school board, which established Deadwood's first school. He also acted as justice of the peace, and judge for the community, the following year his duties began to split up. He failed in his bid for Justice of the Peace, and one year later he and his family left Deadwood for Chicago, Illinois. So that's E.B. Farnham. Now, in the TV show, I don't remember him being involved with the opening up the school and all the other stuff. It doesn't seem like he would be that type of person. Again, he doesn't have any kids, and he's not married. But in real life, he was probably a little better than he was portrayed on the TV show. Next up is George Hurst. Now, the TV show on a show like Deadwood has so many terrible people. To me, George Hurst is the worst. There's not one moment where you're like going, I like George. I mean, from the time he gets there to the time he leaves, we hate George Hurst. Now, when gold was discovered in, in the Black Hills in 1875, Hurst began to take note, and when the Manuel brothers discovered a large outcrop of gold in what would quickly become the Gold Camp lead, Hearst sent people to investigate. In 1877, Hearst arrived in Deadwood along with Hagen, brought the mine, bought the mine from the Manuel brothers, and named it the Homestead Mine. Buying up additional claims in Deadwood area, the Homestead Mining operation soon was the largest of the Black Hills and the leading producer of gold in the United States. So I'm assuming the Manuel brothers is Alma Garrett's claim because Alma Garrett is not a real character. So how he got it, did he force them? You know, I don't have any information on that, but that's George Hurst. But when I think of George Hurst, I'm going to think of George Hurst from the TV show. I just love to hate the guy, and it was great job by Gerald McCraney on the acting, and fantastic character, and again, that's what I'm going with. Next up, we have Wild Bill Hickok, probably the most famous person to come out of Deadwood during that time. A lot of what they showed on the show was true. He was a gambler. He was a drinker. Um, he was uh, well known when he arrived in Deadwood. However, his stay in a rough and tumble camp would be a short one as he was murdered by Jack McCall while playing poker in a Deadwood saloon on August 2nd, 1876. And he was holding aces over eight, eights, which is now known as a dead man's hand. So if you're playing poker and have aces over eights, duck. I'm kidding, of course. Um, now, he was killed by the coward Jack McCall, and that's going to be the next person that we're going to talk about. Unfortunately, Jack McCall was a real person. Uh, McCall drifted west as a young adult, joining a group of buffalo hunters. By the time he arrived in Deadwood in 1876, he was going by the name of Bill Sutherland. McCall felt insulted when Bill gave him money to buy himself something to eat after losing at a poker game and shot him from behind the next day. In the first trial, found to be illegal later, McCall claimed that Hickok had shot his brother in Abilene, Kansas, and was found innocent. McCall hung around Deadwood for several days until a man called California Joe strongly suggested the air might be bad for McCall's health. McCall got the message and believing he escaped punishment for his crime headed to Wyoming bragging to anyone who would listen that he had killed the famous Wild Bill Hillcock. Less than a month later, the trial held in Deadwood was found to be have no legal basis, uh, Deadwood being located on Indian Territory. McCall was arrested in Laramie, Wyoming on August 29, 1876, charged with murder and taken to Yankton, South Dakota to stand trial. On March 1st, 1877, Jack McCall was put to death by hanging. So on this one, he's pretty much portrayed on the TV show was pretty accurate. He was a drunk, he was uh, not a likable guy, and he did shoot Wild Bill in the back of the head uh, when he was playing poker. So that part of the story seems to be true. Next up is Albert W. Merrick. He is the owner of the Deadwood Pioneer, but he actually sent someone else out there to set it up. W.A. Laughlin set up the Pioneer newspaper in Deadwood. The first edition was published on June 8, 1876. Merrick didn't own the paper for long. He sold it to R.O. Adams in 1879, historically known as the first newspaper west of the Missouri. The newspaper is still in publication today. However, it is located in Spearfish, South Dakota. Next up, we have Tom Nuttall. Tom is based on an actual uh, character from Deadwood named William Billy Nuttall. Billy was one of the proprietors of the Nuttall and Mann Saloon Number 10 when Wild Bill Hickok was shot by Jack McCall. Other than being called Tom, his story seems to be pretty much spot on. Next up, we have the Reverend Smith. Reverend Smith served in the Civil War and became a doctor. Well, that's interesting. 
In 1876, he followed the gold rush to Deadwood, becoming the first preacher of any denomination in the Black Hills. Smith never had a church in Deadwood, but used the dirty streets of the mining camp as his sermon mount. To make ends meet, the preacher did little prospecting, worked odd jobs. On August 20th, 1876, Smith, along with Sheriff Isaac Brown, Charles Mason, and Charles Holland, were killed on the road between Crook City and Deadwood. The men were thought to have been killed by Indians. Reverend Smith was 49 years old. His body now lies at Mount Moriah Cemetery, among other notable characters of Deadwood. Next up is Saul Starr, who had a hardware business in Montana with Seth Bullock. The pair followed the Deadwood Gold Rush in August 1876. Starr and Bullock expanded their business interests by purchasing a ranch where they raised livestock and partnered in the Deadwood Flowering Mill in 1880. Starr was one of the first town councilmen elected in 1876, served as postmaster in 1878, was elected mayor in 1884, a position he held for 14 years. Saul Starr never married, so there was no marriage between him and Trixie. So I would say Saul's character on the show was pretty accurate. Next up is Charlie Utter. Now on the TV show Charlie Utter, he's he's kind of he doesn't like to dress up. He's you know he's funny about stuff like that. But I guess in real life he, he enjoyed nice clothes and keeping his hair trimmed and all that different stuff. So that's a little different than what we got on the TV show. But in the spring of 1876, Charlie and his brother Steve organized a wagon train in Georgetown, Colorado, and headed for South Dakota. When the wagon train passed through Cheyenne, Wyoming, he ran into his old friend Wild Bill Hickok, who joined the caravan along with a hundred others, including prospectors, gamblers, and a troop of working girls. Later in Fort Laramie, uh, Calamity Jane also joined the wagon train. The circumstances of how Charlie Utter and Bill, uh, Wild Bill became friends is unknown, maybe through their time in Kansas. By the time Charlie and the rest of the caravan arrived in Deadwood, by mid-July, Charlie and Bill had partnered in the wagon train. One of Utter's self-imposed duties was to look after Wild Bill, protecting him from his worst enemy, himself. Having known Hickok for a long time, Utter was aware of Hickok's habit of excessive drinking, gambling, and could get him in trouble. Monitoring Bill had often protected him from his habits and rarely worked. Upon his arrival in camp, Utter began a mail express service between Deadwood and Cheyenne, where he, he and other riders carried letters for 25 cents apiece. Wow, that's pretty steep. Uh, crossing the hostile plains of the mountains, the riders often carried more than 2,000 letters at a time. When the faithful day of Hickok's murder arrived in August 2nd, 1870, Utter was away tending business affairs. However, as soon as he heard, Charlie rushed back to claim Wild Bill's body. So, for the most part, Charlie Utter's story seems to be pretty good. Charlie Utter did have a freight business, and he did—he was away when uh, Wild Bill was killed. He did return uh, back to Deadwood to claim his body. Next up is Al Swergen, who in real life was every bit as ugly as the character he played in Deadwood. What they don't tell you is that the man lured dozens of women to the camp by falsely promising them good jobs in local hotels and promised to make them stage performers in a popular gem theater. Once they arrived, the women were virtually forced into white slavery or thrown into the street. The man was married three times and was brutal to his wives, and as well as the women he worked for. The Gem Theater caught fire twice in 1879, the second time burning to the ground on both occasions Swearingen rebuilt. Twenty years later, it was demolished again by a third inferno. By this time, Swearingen had called it quits and left Deadwood for good. Not long after, the drunk and penniless Swearingen was killed while trying to hitch a ride to Colorado train like a common tramp. So yeah, um, a lot of the stuff, they, the, Al Swerger's character is a nasty guy on Deadwood, but they kind of softened him up, and I think they brought Cy Tolliver in to make him the real heavy, to make Al a little more likable, if that's possible, but Ian McShane did such a fantastic job playing Al Swerger and one of the best characters in television history. Next up, we have the opposite of Al Swerger, and we have Seth Bullock, who came to Deadwood August 1st, Night 1876, with wagons filled with hardware goods, including picks, pans, shovels, dynamite, cooking utensils, and more. Seth and Saul immediately set up a t- their hardware store in a tent. Later, they, they built a permanent building. Uh, by the time they arrived in Deadwood, had already gained a reputation as a hell-raising filled with miners, transients, gamblers, outlaws, and prostitutes. The day after their arrival, Wild Bill was shot by cow- the coward Jack Bacall. Outraged, the camp began to demand enforcement and the ungoverned territory. Though it's commonly thought the Bullock served as Deadwood's first marshal, that is incorrect. Actually, the camp's first marshal was named Isaac Brown, who was elected by the Miners' Court after a trial of Jack McCall in August 5, 1876. However, when Isaac Brown, along with Reverend Smith and two others, Con Stapleton was appointed 
Marshall of Deadwood. So there, that, that actually did happen. So in 1877, Seth Bullock was appointed by Governor Pennington as the first sheriff of the newly formed Lawrence County. He was also sheriff of the provisional government is what known as uh, South Dakota. Undaunted by the country's lawlessness and, and dangerous nature, Bullock wasted no time appointing several fearless deputies to help him clean up the town. Before long, order had been established in the former hell-raising camp. Bullock never killed a man while serving as Lawrence County Sheriff. According to his grandson, he could outstare a mad cobra or rogue elephant, which was generally enough to convince the rowdy elements to settle down before they took the place. He also became friends with Teddy Roosevelt in the 1800s, uh, and when this uh, Spanish-American War broke out in 1898, Bullock volunteered to be one of Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Uh, Bullock passed away September 23, 1919, his ranch. He died of cancer, and that is Seth Bullock. So Seth Bullock is about 50-50. Obviously, the part with Martha Bullock, she was never married to his brother. Uh, they didn't have a son named William. Uh, that was kind of misleading, but... Overall, I think the Seth Bullock story is amazing. Timothy Oliphant does a great job playing Seth Bullock. You can't deny that. Um, just an amazing series. But now I'm going to talk about characters that were in this show that were not real people. All right, here's a list of a few of the fictional characters. We have Silas Adams, who in the TV show works for Al Swearingen. There's no record of him. William Bullock, as we talked about before, was non-existent. Doc Cochran. There was not a Doc Cochran in Deadwood. Uh, Ellsworth. No Ellsworth. Uh, no Alma Garrett. And so no Brom. Uh, no the dude. Uh, no Sophia. No Joni Stubbs. Joni Stubbs. Uh, Cy Tolliver. No Cy Tolliver. No Francis Wolcott. And Mr. Wu was not around either. So that's it. That's all I've got uh, for you so far today. Um, there is, I will put the website in the notes. There's a lot of information on the, uh, the on the different characters and their background and their history and a lot more than I wanted to put in this video. I didn't want to make it a, a two-hour video. But if you like what we're doing, uh, give it a thumbs up, share it, subscribe, tell a friend, all that fun stuff. And that's all I got. Thanks for listening and uh, watching. I'm out. Bye.